David Mosscrop is a writer, academic, and political theorist who studies democracy, digital media, and political decision making. His latest research focuses on how knowledge circulates on the internet and how micro targeting, big data, fake news, bots, and hacking threaten citizen participation in democracies. A columnist and political commentator, Mosscrop is a frequent contributor to Maclean's and other print and broadcast media, including the Washington Post, the Golden Mail, the National Post, and CBC Radio. He has also worked as a consultant for the Broadbent Institute, the University of British Columbia School of Public Policy and Global Affairs, and Mass LBP on topics such as electoral reform, digital media, and participatory democracy. Mosscrop holds a PhD in political science from the University of British Columbia. He is currently a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Ottawa. Welcome to the Bibliophile. It's nice to be here. Thank you. The book is called Too Dumb for Democracy? Question mark. Why we make bad political decisions and how we can make better ones. Before I uh, confront you on the title, let's turn to the back of the book mm -hmm. and uh, have a look at your acknowledgments. I'm interested in how you uh, took your ideas and uh, turned them into uh, this uh, book that's uh, published by Goose Lane. Goose Lane Editions, and Goose Lane Editions is the oldest independent publisher in the country, of Canada, that is. <laughs> I was thinking about neuroscience, psychology, and democracy back in 2007. Discovered it in the way that Archimedes discovered his formula. You know, eureka moment for me. You're in the bathtub. I was in. I was. I was in a little room, a little study room here in Ottawa, in my house that used to be where we kept the garbage, and I had turned it into a little office space. Okay. And I picked up a book by Antonio Damasio the neuroscientist, and he makes the point early in his book that we ought to be taking this stuff seriously in the social sciences because it'll affect how we think of institutions. And I had picked up this book by accident. I just wanted to read something that had nothing to do with what I was studying at the time, and little did I know. It was about to transform how I thought about politics. And so I went from there, and I finished my master's, went to Korea to teach English, kept reading about this stuff because I had library access. I came to UBC, started my PhD, and then and found a way to connect democratic deliberation, democratic theory, to social psychology. Dropped the neuroscience bit mostly because that research is, wasn't right where I needed it to be yet, and it was really expensive to do. It was running fMRI machines, for instance, if you want to do brain scans, which some social scientists want to do, mm -hmm. $500 an hour or something like that, and you need a tech to run it, and then you've got to figure out the, the software. So I thought, okay, no, I'll take all the data that's already out there because there was plenty and try to make sense of politics in light of that. And so that's where the idea had come from mm -hmm. and then i turned so it really in. the body politic really is the body or it is the brain yeah, it is and for years theorists have been sort of making the point that there's an analogy between the body politic and the body proper and so that had been swirling around in my head for a long time and then one day someone from goose lane called and said uh, i'm an acquisitions editor and are you writing a book it's someone i had known uh, we want to write a big idea book and I said, yes, sure, I'm writing a book, why not? <laughs> and so I took the, all that research and repurposed it uh, for this. You had a book in mind right off the bat, like pretty well every PhD. Yeah. On the phone with her, I remember t talking to her saying, yeah, I know exactly what that book's going to be. Right. Because I, I committed the cardinal academic sin of taking my dissertation, the material, and writing a mass market book instead of a scholarly book. And I did it because I thought this book, I've got an opportunity to write a mass market book, which I wanted to do, but also this is something we need to be talking about right now. And there's a, an awful lot of people who write about democracy in books that are not accessible, either because the language is not accessible or the book is from a, a university press that doesn't get carried in mainstream stores or doesn't get press coverage. So I thought, okay, well, this is an opportunity to talk about important democratic decision-making practices and democratic institutions and the health of our democracy in a way that's accessible, so I'm going to do it. And so I took all of the research, and, uh, that I, and I layered it with anecdotes, stories, and accessible language to make it palatable. 
So the the top level of the book reads like a typical mass market book, mm -hmm. but the guts of it are, are actually years of academic research. So you really didn't have to go and flog your transcript at all. Yeah, you didn't have to go and talk to anyone or try and sell this. I, I no, You're I didn't. Lucky. I you know it's funny the process. I often say this about uh, when someone asks me for advice. Uh, there is no model that I can give anyone mm -hmm. because a lot of what I have have been able to achieve has been atypical. Yeah. The rule is from an old, if I can adapt an old Picasso line that was once told me by the painter Christopher Pratt. I interviewed him years mm. ago, and he's wonderful. I, 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 he was wonderful, and it was so nice. I was young. I was here at the University of Ottawa at the Fulcrum, the student newspaper, and he, I was the arts and culture editor, and he was um, really wise and accommodating, but he said to me, you know, borrowing on Picasso, when luck finds you, it should find you working, and that's what had happened to me. You know, this the woman who asked me about this book knew me because years ago we had worked together, I think, I at um, Open File, which is no longer exists, but back then, and she had taken a chance on me because at the time I was writing articles for eHow, and I wanted to write op-eds and columns, and, and she took a chance. Then I was in the public eye, and one day she sort of saw me say something online about politics and rang me up. Mm. So, and ditto, I, I'm now a columnist with the Washington Post. That happened because I saw a tweet and emailed an editor. So, you know, it is... For the uh, Washington Post covering... Canada. Yeah. Yeah. In the, okay. For the global opinion section, you know, and, and one of the big takeaways is whether it's a book or a column or whatever it is, mm. uh, you've got to be visible and you've got to produce good work. I, I like to draw on the Neil uh, Gaiman principle. He talks about this in his great book and speech, Make Good Art. People, freelancers keep working because they produce good work on time and people like them. Uh, to that, I would add, you also need to be on people's radar. And if mm. you can do some combination of those four things, you're probably in good shape. But one thing I did that was a bit strange with this was I I did it, as my father used to say, bass backwards. I got a book offer. I then found an agent, said no to the initial offer, went with the agent, shopped that around. That must have pissed off uh, Goose Lane. It was, I don't like conflict. I deeply dislike conflict. I, I have, I'm compelled to be honest. And so I had a very awkward conversation. Yeah. And the people at Goose Lane have been nothing but supportive and professional and wonderful and fair. So mm -hmm. I have nothing but nice things to say about them. But I had to call and say, look, this is the right thing for me is just shop it around. And I ultimately ended back up, back around with them. And right. I'm very, very glad that I did. And I'd say anyway. Why is that? Just because they're such a good uh, They're supportive. Fit? Yeah, it was yeah. a great fit. They, they were supportive. The editorial support I got from the production editor, from the substantive editor, from the copy editors, has been very, very good. Mm -hmm. the, the marketing support that I have has been very, very strong. I mean, yeah. we all early on decided that we wanted to produce as a team a good book and then sell it, and we did. And they worked closely with me. And so I think, what, to, I mean, you, so you, you shopped it around and you came back to them. So what was it that, mm, did no one come up with a better financial offer they there were other opportunities their deal was the best deal and i really liked them so that it you shopped it around you had the best deal anyway what i considered the best deal without without you know getting into the details i mean they what ultimately sold it though with for them was uh, i thought it was a good fit and i thought that i believed in the team and i thought that they would support me in writing a good book and selling a good book Despite so that, the fact that you yeah. ran around and tried to sell it to another... Well, I, I expect them to say, don't let the door hit you on the way out. Yeah, and yeah. I would have understood that. Yeah, yeah. Because I rolled the dice. Uh, but they were committed to it and they believed in it. And so I, I, I really respect that. I mean, I, I would do it the same way again. I mean, I, it's, yeah. I think having an agent is useful. I have a fantastic agent. Yeah, what makes him so good? Chris... Uh, Bucci or Bucci, Bucci, yeah, of um, of Cook McDermott. Okay. Uh, since I met him, Cook and uh, the McDermott agency have, have become one. Right. Uh, Chris was very supportive very early on of someone who was basically no one yet. I mean, I was it was early for me. This is he was taking a flyer on you. Yeah, and he but did he, you approach him? No, someone had said to me, "You should talk to my because I uh, Twitter. I had called out on Twitter. Does anyone know anything about book deals?" And someone wrote me in a private message and said, you should talk to this guy I know, Chris Bucci. So I cold called him based on, on her, her introduction. Yeah. So not entirely cold call. 
and had a chat in the rain in Vancouver one day, walking down the street and uh, on the phone. And his vision for it was supportive. He saw something there. He had been in academic publishing previously, which for me was fantastic. Yeah, it was like yeah. he knew that space. And he had worked with um, writers that I liked, with um, Joseph Heath, Andrew Potter. And so I, in my sense was he would understand this. I have been, this has worked for me extremely. I've been very lucky that mm. everything fell into place. And everyone I worked with saw the vision, agreed with the vision. We, from day one, thought we had a hit that we could move. And so it all came together. Mm. I'm a little bit nervous that my first experience has been so good. <laughs> right. I don't know what's going to happen next. You know, you yeah. hear these stories of, 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 you know, creative people getting screwed and, and learning the ropes. I think of Van Morrison all the time. <laughs> Van Morrison's a great example of that. Mm. And, but my experience has been so so nice and so pleasant I actually um, <laughs> you know I worked hard but I didn't take a lot of knocks in this process yeah, Natalie Brender put you in touch with Chris yeah who's that I knew her from Twitter Jeez, uh, Twitter is there's uh, I love Twitter yep yeah. there's so much bad press about Twitter yeah. but oh there's a lot of nonsense and there's a lot of there's a, social media provide you know poses a threat to a number of things, democratic institutions, personal well-being, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. But if you do it right, you yeah. can build a really strong community. Twitter has, uh, and, and social media more generally, yeah. has played a huge role in many of the big wins in my life. I don't know if I would have had those wins without it. I don't know the counterfactual. Mm -hmm. But I know that it certainly facilitated them. And I, so I thank my Twitter community in the acknowledgments <laughs> because do. they truly made a big difference. And I felt like while I was reading the book that they were there. It was, I would go on between, I, I do the Pomodoro method. So I'd, I'd write for 45 minutes and I'd take 15 minutes off, grab a coffee, take a walk, go on Twitter, yeah. talk to people. And it was a nice little, it was like checking in with your friends between classes. Mm -hmm. So what about Natalie? What, what's her story? I don't, I don't know. I can't remember. <laughs> what? I, um, She's what? She's just someone you met on Twitter? Yeah, I've never met her. Oh, okay. I've never met okay. her. This is, what, this is so interesting. Is I've never met her in, in face to face. And many of the people who, who helped me think this through, um, I had never met face to face. I mean, the folk, most of the folks I name I have. But yeah, yeah, Megan Sally. That's my partner. I, her I've met face to face. <laughs> Recently, even. I've seen, uh, and later tonight for dinner. You're probably telling her I'm, uh, the guy's late. I, uh, yeah, no, uh, we're, we're going to have tacos later. It's going to be great. Okay. Then finally, uh, Paul Surratt, you uh, give him your eternal thanks. I do. Yeah. So I think the book wouldn't have been possible without Paul because years ago, when I was a dumb undergrad from nowhere, pretty misinformed and misformed and a little bit misanthropic and eager but you know and with a lot of energy that needed to be challenged paul came along and said i've got some ideas for you and and he was the one who put me on to democratic deliberation and and this stuff and yeah. uh, through uh, a number of authors so he was your master supervisor yeah yeah, yeah. and now and you. now a friend he's here he's local in ottawa and, and so we're now friends and in fact the apartment i live in okay was previously owned by him and his and his partner, and that's how I found an apartment when I moved to Ottawa. It, it sounds like my life is much easier than it is, but I have to say I do get lucky fairly often. Too Dumb for Democracy, or Too Dumb for Democracy? Yes, that's the one. Who picked that title? I did, uh, but it's not mine. It, it comes from a 2014 episode of Ideas, from, uh, CBC Ideas, that I did. Which was another lovely stroke of... Not luck necessarily, but good fortune. Not luck, but yes, I, I like the good fortunes, right? I mean, I applied to do it. There was a call out. And okay. I saw it on the listserv. I was in my PhD. And because ideas, it's, just for those who don't know, is a, is a, a, a popular radio program on the CBC in Canada. Yeah, and it's it's an institution. I grew up listening to it. Yeah. In fact, I remember when the episode aired, hearing Paul Kennedy uh, just say my name. And thinking yeah, it's that got come a, a long way. It's yeah. distinctive. It's, it's a very distinctive voice, yeah. Yeah, so I applied, and, and they were doing coverage of doctoral work across the country, a couple mm -hmm. of uh, per season, and it fit, um, which got, gave me the sense early on that this was a winner of an idea, that it was on the register yeah. for folks. But they called it Too Dumb for Democracy. 
and I, and I had no say in it. So I remember the next day seeing the title thinking, oh, my Lord, I'm in trouble now. You know, this go, you know, yeah. hundreds of thousands of people listen to this show. I, they're going to be irritated at best. And then I started getting feedback and everyone loved it. And they would write to me and say the same thing. I know just who you're talking about. It was never them. It was always their neighbor, course, their dentist, yeah. their doctor, their friend. But uh, so when the book came up, I thought, okay, well, this is, the title's great. It captures what I'm trying to get at. The question mark does a lot of important work. You're, you're building on the, what, the brand already. They've already produced the brand for you. You're just building on it, I guess. Well, and, I mean, it, it wasn't, it was a good brand. It wasn't prominent. But it, mm. it, it, what it did was it allowed me to answer no. Mm-hmm. That we're not too dumb, no. which is a, a useful little uh, tool. And, and, of course, the subhead is why we make bad political decisions and how we can make better ones. And so it, it's a little bit, perhaps some folks see it as a little bit offensive at the top, but it's actually mm-hmm. meant to be constructive. Well, it grabs your attention, which is important. Yeah. yeah I guess my answer to, to, uh, to that uh, question is no. I think we're more apathetic than dumb. I would say alienated i mean in the sense that yeah disillusioned uh, disillusioned another, yeah. yeah i mean i've never met an apathetic person in my life now that when i say that people look at me like i've got three heads but it's true you find someone and, and they say yeah okay i don't care well they don't care and you, the proof that they don't care is that they're not showing up at the polls well it's funny is that if you press them you realize that they they do care about things so if you say to them okay you know you say you don't care but do you care about school price of you know, housing affordability, child care, do you care about taxes? Yeah, they care. They do. And and they have senses of what they want, what they don't want. But they get disillusioned or apathetic somewhere along the the road and they feel left out of the system and so they don't take part. And and that's when you see voter turnout in the 60s. Mm -hmm. Last election was, yeah, it was 58% and we celebrated Mm -hmm. it. Uh, Meanwhile, in PEI, incidentally, the last provincial election, voter turnout was slightly down at 80.5%. Yeah, and Alberta was 71. (laughs) Yeah, so so there is a push. Maybe it'll go back up. We were trying to understand why that is. I mean, there's some alienation there. There's some, there's one theory that things were actually pretty good and elections weren't competitive and so people stayed home. Mm-hmm. So it's, in theory, if that's true, you'd expect turnout to actually start going back up. If things are sort of starting to go pear-shaped and elections are competitive, then you might see it actually go back up. We'll see. But I mean, one of the things I'm trying to argue in the book is, is the need to bring people into the political process to start building those relationships and encouraging them to take more part because one of the takeaways from years of research is people have phenomenal capacity when you give them a chance and you give them the right circumstances. If you stop someone on the street when they're on the way to work or to the coffee shop and say, who's the governor general? And they're like, I, I don't, what do I, I'm trying mm-hmm. to do a thing here. Yeah, I'm of trying course, to make a living. Yeah. Exactly. I'm not, I'm not looking up who the governor general is. I don't even know what that is. Mm-hmm. It's easier than say, oh, geez, people are dumb. But they're not. It's, mm-hmm. it's, they have other interests and other concerns. When you, when you put them in the right spot and give them a chance, they actually perform quite well. Okay, so let's get into it. Okay. Why do we make bad decisions? Well, a couple of reasons. Yeah, actually, sorry, I'll I'll let you talk at some point. (laughs) I did find in the book it was sort of point A and then one, two, three, four, five. Point B, one, two, three, four, five. Point C. I mean, that's how the book is is laid out. And it's because it's how my brain works. You know, it's funny. is I write my columns pretty quickly, maybe 45 minutes to write a column. But I can't help but think in, in terms of, of that structure. And it's the old, you know, the old Picasso joke. To, I, mean, I don't know why I'm being so particular about Picasso. You know, it's an apocryphal story as he's doodling on a napkin, he throws it away, and someone yeah. says, going to have it. And he says, yeah, yeah, $20,000. And they mm-hmm. say, what are you talking about? It took you 25 seconds. He said, no, it took me 25 years. He says, I'm Picasso. <laughs> right? It just just because of, because it's me. Yeah, and it's, what it is is, you know, you... you a structure gets embedded in your head and it's how you start to think and for me it's how I think. So uh, that betrays a little bit the, the academic origins of the book but you know I'm trying to build a case and that case is we make bad political decisions and bad decisions in all c- kinds of areas of our life. Joe Heath's written about this in Enlightenment 2.0 because our psychology doesn't fit our environment particularly well. We're adapted for a very different, simpler, slower, lower stress environment than the one we're in. Now we're facing too much information too quickly from too many places and we're asked to do things that aren't natural to us. And the analogy I use is we're no, we're no better born to make good political decisions than we are born to hit a fastball. We can do it, 
but it takes work. Yeah. And it takes practice and, and it takes a skill set. And so I'm trying to make the argument for, okay, we need to build that skill set because not only do we make mistakes in our political decisions, there are people who are actively exploiting our psychological shortcomings to manipulate us to get outcomes that they want. They don't care if we make good political decisions. They want us to support their policy or donate to their party or vote for them. And look what's happened with Brexit. Mm-hmm. There's not much you can do about all the lying that mm-hmm. takes place. And, and, and in the States, interference by foreign powers, emphasizing certain new information that's bogus. And in Canada, you know, there was a recent CBC story. They analyzed 5 million tweets going back to 2013 and found that Venezuelan, Syrian, Russian folks, um, bots at accounts have been operating in Canada to try to stir up trouble, poison mm-hmm. discourse, and a mm-hmm. genocide. How do you get around that? I mean, you you make bad decisions based on what you think. You No, you make good decisions based on what you trust and yes. what you, facts that you think are true. Yeah. Well, so this is it. Part of part of making good political decisions is having good information. So it's it's hard to make rational political decisions, for instance, or what I call autonomous political decisions, just decisions that have reasons that you can explain and that are your own without having good information. Otherwise, you get garbage in, garbage out. Mm. So the trick there is is coming up with trusted sources uh, and heuristics, because we're all going to you know, mental shortcuts. Shortcuts, yeah. And we're all going to use mental shortcuts all the time for all kinds of things. So by that, you mean going to columnists that you trust, for example? Or a news source you trust, yeah. or scholarly research that you trust, if you have access yeah. to it, whatever it may be. Okay. Uh, now, I say you need to also pair that with a commitment to having a variety because part of what you want to do is kick yourself off of cognitive autopilot. You don't want to just read the communist worker all day. No. I mean, I've, I'm, a, I'm a social Democrat. The vast majority of my reading is center and center, right? Mm. I don't need to agree. I don't need to nod my head all day. And I find but in that fact, you, it's more interesting to read the opposite of what you believe. Far more interesting. And, and this is an old John, you know, this is an old point from John Stuart Mill to, to milk an old classical liberal, you know, it, it forces you to come up with reasons for things that you believe. If, mm. if you can't provide those reasons, well, then you're in trouble, right? Mm. And, and so it does push you to, to consider your own prejudices a little bit. Well, so reasons uh, are what convince people to vote one way or the other. Yeah, and it's a currency. Um, it's a form of, of what one scholar would call deontic scorekeeping, basically, is, is you give me a reason and it, that's like making a promise to me, and I tick a box. I, okay, you've said you want X for a reason Y. Okay, now you've, we've made a bargain. Now there's something I can I can engage with you on that reason. I can like it, I can dislike it, I can argue it, I can interrogate it, and I believe that you have given me that reason in good faith. Now we can have a discussion. That, that's the problem, though. Politicians don't give you reasons in good faith. Look what happened in the Brexit referendum, mm-hmm. where those big bus boards were promising huge amounts of euros pouring into the national health if, yeah. if they left. Yeah. So what do you do about that? The paradigm that I'm trying to push is, is a deliberative democratic paradigm that's based on a politics of reason giving. Mm-hmm. We could adopt that more or less. It doesn't have to be everything. It has to be deliberation. But we could we could vote for people who did that. And there are people who do that. Uh, some do it better than others. Politicians are incentivized not to because of the strategic nature of politics. Well, that's the thing. They're politi- I guess politicians, what they see that works is negative advertising and emotional-laden messages that, that undermine your whole argument. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the literature on emotional advertising interesting is interesting because it, it works for some... It doesn't work for others. Sometimes it suppresses turnout. Sometimes it suppresses the other team's turnout, which you want. I mean, it's all kinds of cynical nonsense. But the emotional point that you raise, that resonance, is critical. It's not inherently bad. It's nice to have a connection. Mm. But if it's a bunch of bull, then you're in trouble. And if if the Brexit thing, Nigel Farage had to go up and say, look, we're going to roll the dice on Brexit. There's a small chance we're going to have to stockpile insulin and body bags. Uh, you know, that would have been a very different vote. Mm-hmm. It shows you the weaknesses of referendum, but this gets to the heart of the matter. The changing behavior requires us to change institutions. So if we said we're not going to do referendums anymore because they are a terrible way to make policy, 
we're going to do citizens assemblies where you randomly select in citizens and they're given months or you know weeks or months or even a year to sit down and deliberate and have access to experts mm -hmm. and then to recommend something that's a far better process for instance so if we can commit to better institutions we can actually change behaviors and what's great about say a citizens assembly is those people in there are ordinary people they do great work. They then become heuristics for other people. Other people can look to them and say, oh, I trust those. That, that person's like me. Mm -hmm. But that person's done the legwork. work. They've done the light work. Right. And this is actually coming, being used in Ontario? They've been used across the world. Um, it was used in Ontario in 07 for electoral reform. It was used in BC in 0345 on electoral reform. How come, and, how come they aren't using it more often? I mean, that's a long time ago. It is. And I mean, it, it was used in Belgium fairly recently for, for the, the G1000. They actually ended up with 700 and so people uh, collect, sitting down and talking about the EU. It's been used locally, uh, hyper-locally. So you get neighborhoods, Grandview Woodlands in, in Vancouver did, for instance, and uh, you know, Mass LBP, with whom I've done some work in the past, convenes these things. So they find that there's actually small versions of these, which citizen reference panels are the smaller version. Yeah. These things are actually happening all the time. I'm trying, the book is for me not just a book, it's a project and, and a commitment. It's a mission. Sounds it's a like, mission. Yeah. It is. And I, I'm trying to get this on the register provincially and federally as a normal thing we could do routinely. And I'm trying to get political parties to bite because it's a great way to produce policy and to build trust and civic capacity. Mm -hmm. But here's a catch. Okay. It involves politicians giving up a little bit of their power and, and control, which you know they're loath to do. Well, I think you mentioned the 15% or something like that, didn't you? For? Uh, I guess the, the what, the, uh, was it the budget or the oh, percentage yes. of uh, the budget that was sort of allocated using this method? Yeah, so there are, so participatory budgeting is a, is a sort of variety of, of participatory democratic mm -hmm. um, process. And it is, it's sort of like a citizens assembly. You convene a group of citizens randomly who are given a percentage of the budget to allocate. And it, this was sort of pioneered most recently in Porto Alegre in Brazil, but it's been used around the world as well, including Canada. You can do it with 3% of the budget. I mean, if and in fact, if we're talking like a federal budget, it would be appropriate to assign a tiny percentage because the federal budget is, is actually largely spoken for year over year because we have commitments. But it's a lot of money and, and you can actually do a lot with half a percent, for instance. Municipally, maybe you give 5%. Mm. But what we find, well, what researchers find is that when citizens are given control over even small parts of the budget, they spend it very wisely arguably more wisely than some politicians do. Mm -hmm. They know what the local concerns are. Yeah. So it's spending on health, it's spending on parks, it's spending on education. It's, a, it's input from, from people who are actually affected by the policies, yeah. right? And who are, you know, they're not experts in the way that the... But nor the are MPs. But nor are, well, yeah, or, or, you know, they're not experts in the way that, that bureaucrats and the finance department are experts, but they're experts in the sense that they know what they need in their lives. I mean, mm. everyone is an expert on themselves and their, and their family and their life. Yeah. We need more of that in politics where people can sit down with you and say, with something on the line, let me tell you. And, you know, again, we need a balance between that and representative democracy. Yeah. I don't want to be a full-time politician. No. I, most people don't want to be, and bless their souls, because we've got other things. The whole point yeah. of having a, this representative democracy is you can go and hang out on the weekends. You don't have to worry about this stuff. Well, that's right. You, it, you Theoretically, you trust who you vote for, yeah. and you think that they're, they've got your best interests at heart. Yeah. And so they're the ones that are making decisions for you. Yeah. And but I, what I want to do is rebalance a little bit the proportion of, of what is done by representatives and what is done by citizens. Not mm -hmm. a lot. Yeah. In the same way Just that... Just enough to get people involved in the process. Exactly. Exactly. In, in, in the same way that we take small parts of the legal process mm -hmm. and give those to people and juries. Right. And the thing is, too, you've, you've indicated in the book that uh, and the book is Too Dumb for Democracy... That people should get paid for this. Yes. Or that they should get time off work to do this and incidentally get time off work to vote. Yes. Oh, yes. And, and you know, we should ask citizens to do something. We should ask them to have some skin in the mm -hmm. game and mm -hmm. participate in civic life. We shouldn't ask them to become martyrs. And if we want that... We should make it easy for them. We should make it easy and we should make sure that uh, those who can't afford to do it for all kinds of reasons... 
their caregivers, their single parents, they're working three jobs, they've got no savings, they can't take a job, whatever, um, are given support to do that. Mm-hmm. That's because how you get an equitable di- equitable distribution. And speaking of equitable, that's one of the one of the problems with capitalism is is the vast inequality that exists. Right, and it's worse and worse. And the, the rich, as as you indicate, are the ones that really what are able to manipulate the system and get the policies that benefit them rather than the rest of us. So, I t- in the book, I talk about the United States and a study that was done by two political scientists, Gillen and P- Gillens and Page, and they found that studying policy from, I think it was 1970 to 2000 in the United States, the U.S. was functioning in oligarchy. Special interest and moneyed interests were getting the policies they wanted overwhelmingly. Everyone else, not so much. And, and you know, the, the mechanism for the wealthy getting what they want is they have resources. Mm-hmm. One of those resources is money. But another one is skills. They have a skill set. They have networks. They can call politicians. They can they can call bureaucrats. They can call you know, influential mm-hmm. civic leaders, mm-hmm. and they have a skill set to make an argument as well as money to donate or to patronize or whatever it may be. It's not just money. It's in the U.S. more so. I was going to say with Canada. corporations, it's huge money going into lobby groups. Oh, money for sure. Lobby groups for sure. But I mean, it, it, money and skill sets and networks, sure. and that's how the world. Um, works. And what I'm trying to say is, look, I mean, I understand that's going to be part of our democracy. But if we don't look at democratizing, you know, who has influence and to some extent democratizing the economy, what we found and find this throughout history is that the middle collapses. And when the middle collapses, that's the ball game. Mm -hmm. And if you're looking around the world and saying there's a global democratic recession, there's a growing distrust, there's rising extremism, including populist authoritarianism and and white nationalism, supremacy. Uh, And then on top of all that, the looming threat of catastrophic effects of climate change. What does that mean for our political institutions? And so I'm making the argument that we can either do this the easy-ish way now or the very, very, very hard way in a couple of decades, and you're not going to want to have to do it the hard way because... that's revolution. Well, we're talking 1789 France. You know, I think I I have a huge... My favorite chapter in the book is chapter two. It's the history chapter of the rise and fall of democracy. And we would have to have our heads way up inside of ourselves to think that this might not collapse in the way that all of these other polities have collapsed throughout history. Of course we're not different. No one's different. It all falls apart mm. uh, if you don't tend it. And I'm looking at the history of revolutions. And in the process of this, I did some interviews. And, and one uh, old senior writer that I interviewed, distinguished. I don't want to say his name because I don't have permission to, sure. to link this. But yeah. um, it said, you know, when I was studying this years ago, I gave us a 50-50 chance. And now I give us 60-40 against. And he had been studying this for decades. Very serious writer. Canadian or American? <laughs> Canadian. Okay. Canadian. Oh, the Americans are even they. You know, the Americans. Yeah. So people like Francis Fukuyama have written about this. Mm. Ziblatt and Levitsky wrote a great book called How Democracies Die. Uh, you know, Why Nations Fail, the Asimoglu and Robinson book is another winner. These books are looking at, the Fukuyama book is actually very good. He's, he's redeemed himself from his nonsense in the 90s. He wrote a two-volume piece on the rise and fall of political authority. These people are all looking at this, and these are serious conservative-ish scholars, not radicals. Yeah. And they're saying, oh, we're in big, big trouble because our institutions are collapsing. And look what the, look what the, uh, Trump is doing to those institutions well, Trump is on a, a daily basis. Absolutely. But what's interesting about Trump is that Trump is the opportunistic infection on a diseased body, right? Yeah. I mean, as Ziblatt and Levitsky argue in, in How Democracy Dies, the, the decline of American norms, the soft guardrails of democracy, they call it, started in basically with Lyndon Johnson, and have been declining ever since. And Trump has just come in, and he's he's the worst of it. But he didn't start it. He would, no. and even the Economist, they downgraded the U.S. recently in their democracy index. Mm-hmm. Um, said this isn't Trump is is wasn't even factored into the downgrade because he was after. He was the result. Trump is what you get when the downgrade happens. He's not the downgrade himself. It's what you get. And well, that's he's, he's also a result of of. Uh the people that voted for him being alienated and um, disillusioned, and all of, the, and they want to to drain the swamp, or dismantle the system. Yeah. Oh yeah, I mean, Trump voters are interesting because they're a collection of you know people want to say it's all X, Y, or Z. The truth is, 
Trump voters are a collection of yeah. alienated folks, um, economically marginalized people, racists, white, ex- you know, supremacists. Plus rich people who like to get tax yes. breaks. Yeah, the Sheldon Adelson crowd and, and or just Republicans who are uncomfortable with him, but they're Republicans. And so they identify with the party so much that they're going to vote for him. They're actually yeah. very nice people. You know, you can have a great conversation, stay at their home and have a lovely time, but then they vote for Trump. I mean, mm. You know, Trump got whatever he got. It was an astronomical number of votes. And not all of those people are awful people. You know, it's not a half of Americans voting age are not terrible people. So it speaks to a lot of things. But, you know, the, the American presidential system is also a challenge. And, you know, one of the things I try to argue in the book is that systems matter. There's a long-term puzzle in political science about how the U.S. presidential system was able to operate successfully in the U.S. because it didn't work anywhere else. You know, you look around the world at the top democracies, almost all of them are parliamentary. You look at basket case countries, almost all of them are presidential. And it turns out the solution to the puzzle is it doesn't work in the U.S. either. It was just delayed, and now it's collapsing. Mm. And one of the nice things about Canada is the system actually works better here than in most places. It doesn't mean we're invulnerable. In fact, we have some pretty disconcerting trends to, to worry about. But yeah, let's focus on the chance. U.S. and then move to Canada. How's that? Sure. Okay. Sorry, I interrupted you. No, I mean, so in, in the American case, you know, the U.S. presidential system is a mess. The, the influence of money is out of control. Mm-hmm. The politicization of everything, including court appointments, uh, is tearing the country apart. Race relations are uh, not particularly healthy, even though um, people seem to think that, that that's been solved. It hasn't. Um, and, you know, and, and that's just off the top of my head, and anyone can do that. Yeah, and I, I guess that's the environment that we're that that, uh, that voters are living in right now, yeah. and and the way they make their minds up about who to vote for. It's a mix, a whirling mix of rationality and emotion. You're not suggesting taking emotion out of it, are you? No, Antonio Damasio has got a great line about this. He says, you know, you know, basically, he says. If you remove emotion from decision making, you don't get better decision makers. You get psychopaths. <laughs> That's not better. So you, we need emotion, but it's nice to be able to know that emotion plays a role and to be able to control it rather than to have it control us. And, and what's interesting is that you know when you look at partisan identity in the in the United States, it is so very strong. People aren't. They don't vote Republican or Democrat. They are Republican or Democrat, like they are a man or a woman or, um, you know, six feet tall or, or four feet tall. I mean, they, it, is, it is part of their very being. And that sets you up for uh, quite a struggle. Well, it's, uh, partisanship is, is an emotional brain in response. Yeah. Yes, it is. And, uh, you know, being partisan isn't. You know, it, parties disagree, and you can disagree and, and be rational. But, but, you know, identifying as a partisan, as a person, mm-hmm. is the emotional thing, right? It's like you can behave in partisan ways that isn't a part of your identity. Lots of that. It's when it becomes part of your identity that it becomes a problem because well, it biases so, you. Well, yeah, it biases you, and you think you're the good guys and the other guys are the bad guys. And to sort of, you know, I wrote about this in the context of Canada and the SNC Lavalin affairs, is then you start thinking that the ends justify the means. And then, of course, the other side thinks the same thing because you're all playing by the same rules or lack thereof. Mm. And then you're in big trouble. Why else do we make bad decisions? Well, I mean, like I said, you know, it, our psychologies get manipulated deliberately. We face too much information too fast from too many sources. I mean, the, the sheer amount of information is overwhelming. The, we don't have any time to really sit down and think about this stuff. We're not incentivized to. Uh, and we don't build the skill sets we need to make rational, autonomous political decisions for the same reason that we we don't hit a fastball. You know, if we, we can't just get up off our couch, just walk down to the diamond and hit a fastball. There's no reason for us to build those skills. Now, uh, my argument is there's plenty of good reasons to build those skills uh, for the sake of democracy. But when people are just trying to get through the day, that can be a hard sell. Mm-hmm. And when governments aren't encouraging them to do that or parties aren't encouraging them to do that. I mean, there's a role for elites here to encourage people to do better. But what they're doing is they're ragging the puck. You know, they don't want to do They don't want to devolve that power. But, I mean, again, my argument is you can do it now the easy way or later the hard way. Yeah. The easy way is better. It's, the easy way is always better. Well, the peaceful way. Yeah, the sustainable way. You know, uh, Louis 
the 16th could have called the States General years before he did. He, you know, he, could, have, he could have picked up that people were starving on the streets of, of Paris uh, years before he did, and, and 1799 might have gone very differently. That's the problem, though, is you look at Trudeau in the last election, and he promised all of this kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. He basically talked about the middle class and giving them more money and more more power, uh, cleaning up the system, being more transparent. Changing. I assume that that what that they that they his team knows about this type of process that you're talking about. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, I it's I've, not. It's you know you haven't discovered anything here necessarily. No, but I, mean, I I have all I've talked to many politicians and and some civil servants and people around town about this too so it's uh, and i'm not hiding the book under a bushel so everyone you know it's it's there people are aware of it but uh, during that election he promised all of this stuff. well in electoral reform i mean they, they exactly and, and you bring that up in the book yeah as an example of uh exactly what not to do yeah and and i think part of it is i, I use the old analogy of the of the pickle barrel that's an old bit from moral philosophy which is you know how does a good person go bad and it's sort of the same way a cucumber becomes a pickle it sits in the pickle barrel mm-hmm. or in the brine and then it becomes pickled and festers yeah and that's what happens to people otherwise good people who end up in these situations they're on these institutions where well, they're incentivized to do things that they otherwise wouldn't do like break their promises or you know so why are they incentivized to break their promises because what? It Political expedience. Hold on yeah. to power? Yeah. Now, I mean, my pushback is always, what's the point of having power if you're not doing good things with it? But they might say, look, I mean, there's only so much we can do. We want to hold on, and the other guys are worse. You know, this was, we saw this with the SNC. was like, yes, we've made a mistake, but do you really want Stephen Harper back? Let's look at your process of making a political decision, your vote coming up. Trudeau is calling uh, Andrew Scheer... A, in effect, a, a white supremacist and a liar. Mm-hmm. So how do you, as a citizen, process that? Well, I mean, I, I think the first thing is you discount it immediately. I mean, you know, when a politician says something critical about an opponent, it might be true, it might not be. You should assume, though, that that's not convincing until you have got a good third-party <laughs> indication that it is. Now, you know, politicians, just like the media, will set the agenda. They'll put things on the register they'll that you can it, think of. Yeah. yeah. Well, they'll frame it in very specific ways that will try to benefit them. Mm-hmm. But, you know, as soon as you start talking about something, it's now in the public realm. It's now in the public interest. You can then find better or worse heuristics. So this, the, the, the key here is, is t- checking that against heuristics that you trust. And that's typically going to be the media uh, who are doing the important work of of sorting this stuff because you can't possibly do it yourself. And then commentary from people that you trust who are digging into this, right? I mean, some are better than others, but... Well, the thing is, uh, and again, that's part of the problem, is that political parties and people that work for them spending a lot of time trying to undermine the credibility of these people, the, the, the media uh, columnists and... Yeah. Uh, well, so there's some data out right now from proof strategies, and they find that, and this is a finding we come across all the time, uh, academics, scientists are still really well trusted and respected. Mm. So they're, they're holding up pretty well, which is good news. Journalists slipping a little bit, not, not as much. But, you know, in the U.S., attacking the press is good politics. In Canada, it doesn't seem to be working quite the same way. And Andrew Scheer recently sort of floated a trial balloon of taking a run at the press and very quickly decided to walk that approach back. So there's still a norm against doing that to some extent. Now, there's a certain variety of person on the fringe to whom that appeals, but that's we're talking margins. So we should be watching it, but it's not a crisis. Um, but again, I mean, I, finding journalists you like and trust, and there are plenty of them, is is critical. But then, well, of course, are mixing there plenty them up. of them in Canada? Though there's uh, there's such a concentration of uh, media ownership. What, what I like, yeah, agreed, and that's I talk about this in the book. It's a big problem, in, especially in a small market like Canada. And although the the nature of the fragmenting media space is that, you know, the 
smaller outlets are doing good work and there's more of them. Uh, mm-hmm. CBC, interestingly enough, uh, now has more revenue than all newspapers combined. They've just recently crossed that access. Um, that's a combination of, rev- of programming and ads and government appropriations. But um, but they've got plenty of money. They they play an important role as a trusted source, although they've got their own problems. Uh, sure we could talk do. about... Um, Getting into opinion for one but, thing, yeah. So yeah. we could talk. That'd be but, a, be, someday we could talk about that. But yeah. I mean, I, you know, what I do find though is how what, whatever concerns you have about media ownership and, and conglomerates, I have huge concerns. Individual journalists remain quite good. As a, you know, part of that work is finding individual journalists you trust, and there's lots of those. And that's what makes Twitter good because you can get a sense of people, yeah. and they're providing information real time for free. Um, as they're parsing the stuff out on social media, and that's actually a very valuable. I mean, I don't go to newspapers anymore the way that I used to. I, I have a news feed full of stuff, and then I have a couple magazines that I will read, and I'll peruse real quick on the weekends. But I'm getting everything from following journalists who are doing yeah, the work of putting it out there. The columnists, particularly, but yeah, yeah, and it does, and it and it works, and and you know. So how does this uh, relate to your book, though? Well, because a good, you need good information, and you need. Um, ideally information that comes from a variety of sources and so curating i mean one of the things is is it's worth investing the time in curating a a group of people you trust Mm -hmm. you know you could in theory do the primary research yourself but probably not no one really has the time or resources to do that so that's that's why twitter's so good though i find i can you know you can identify the uh, sources or uh, you know commentators that you trust yeah and follow them quite quite easily. Yeah, and you can tell. I mean, I, I'll do this. I have a little trick when I'm going through Twitter is I'll check someone's profile and see who follows them mm-hmm. and who they follow. So to again to establish their credibility. Yeah, because it's a heuristic as well. So I don't have time to research this yeah. person. I don't, yeah. I don't. You know, I'm not yeah. that invested. But I can have a quick look and see who they're interacting with and see. You know, if it's someone I trust, trust them. We do this all the time in our life. We use our family. We use mm-hmm. our friends. It's almost it's a reference. It's a reference system mm-hmm. basically. Mm-hmm. Um, no, and Facebook has exploited that, really. Oh yeah, I mean, this but, is but, yeah, yeah. We, yeah. Facebook is is monetized that and, and manipulates people while violating their privacy as well. But um, you know, it, if Twitter has a problem of of amplifying nonsense and bots trying to set the agenda and poison conversation, but mm-hmm. there is a f- answer to that, which is you know, very early and often mute, delete block, ignore, yeah. and find the people you trust. And, and the key is coming up with good information. The, then the other, the second thing is once you've got that information is is carving out space. Even I, in the book, I think I say 20 minutes, you know, the length of a yeah. sitcom, 22 minutes. Yeah. Sit there and think about it a little bit. It doesn't have to be a ton of time. You've got the stuff to this do. Is your, this is your uh, obligation as, as a uh, Canadian citizen or a citizen of a democracy. I think so. Right. And, you know, 20, 40, 60, 80, you do it 20 minutes a day, five days a week. It's not a lot of time. Uh, you, you know, you spend more time flipping through Instagram on your phone or watching bad mm-hmm. television. Mm-hmm. Carve out a little bit of that to consider this stuff, and it goes a long way. And if you add to that being aware of that emotional biases and, and cognitive biases exist, and I run through a list of them in the book, like all of what? a sudden, give, give us those. you know, um, likability is an interesting heuristic that gets exploited. If you like someone, you you find what they say more truthful and favorable. You mean you like the way they look? Or the, what? Well, there's lots of different mechanisms. You like the way they look. You like the way they talk. They sound smart. Uh, you just like them as a person for any whatever reason that you may or may not know. An- another one is things that we, we hear of more often, we think is, uh, of as more important. Uh, so if you keep hearing the same thing over and over again, you're more likely to judge us as being important, even though maybe it's completely marginal. It's just getting a lot of coverage. Well, it's just uh, that's how advertising works. Just huge re- repetition. Like repetition. Yeah. Uh, you know, anchoring bias is an interesting one. Is that you know if you you know say I say to you, we're going to go out for dinner. It's going to be a hundred bucks. Uh, but you've got two other options. One is 80, one is 60. All of a sudden, those sound pretty reasonable because your brain is anchored in 100. Whereas if I had said to you, let's go for dinner, it'll cost you 40 bucks. And then I said 60, you'd say, geez, that's a little bit much, right? <laughs> so anchoring is another one. Uh, framing effects. So I talk about in the book an example of, of you know, this old example that's given is, uh, you know, you've got to have a surgery. There's a 90% success rate. You, do you want to do it? You say yes. Okay, you need to have a surgery. There's a 10% failure rate. 
do you want to do it? And you say no. Is that the you know the subtle changes in the way things are worded or framed to you have a profound impacts? So we judge them differently. Then politicians are expert at exploiting yeah. this stuff. Yeah, I've got a long list in the book of, of name of ways that bills are named. You know, yeah. the Patriot Act, the yeah. whatever, get crooked liars out of government. You know, all these things. Politicians are very good at naming bills to try to to frame right. Mm. And so you know, being aware that that's that exists and being a little bit critical of the language that's used. These things are all, you know, because we, we, we're using heuristics all the time. We're on autopilot all the time. Yeah. But kicking off that a little bit goes a long way. Right. So, uh, so again, you're, you're talking uh, or advising members of a democracy simply to, to think rationally and take some time, mm-hmm. slow down a bit yeah. cause, because everything is coming at you so fast. Yeah. And don't try to do everything. I mean, part of it is, if you say, look, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to know every in and out of every news item I find, you're, you're never going to get through the day. It's just too much. I mean, I, I do that for a living, more or less, and I find it overwhelming. So it, it, it is. It's a lot. But what you can do is say, look, I'm, I'm going to read, you know, half a dozen news stories a day. I'm going to follow... 30 journalists I trust, some of whom disagree with one another. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give myself 20 minutes a day to think about a couple issues I think are important. And I'm going to discount what I hear from politicians until I can consider a little bit and dig into what they're trying to do when they say what they say. That program isn't particularly onerous, especially if it's Mm -hmm. backed up by governments that bring people into the process a little bit from time to time. It is both, I think, a civic duty but also a long-term self-interest play. Mm. Because if if this all falls apart, and it might, what you end up with is probably going to be worse than what you have now. So it's worth putting a little bit of time and effort now to preserve it for the long run. That's the thing, though. We just don't operate that way, do we? Look, here's the, the planet is about to right. disintegrate, and people just don't give a shit. Well, and, and it's a bias. We have a sort of presentist bias, is that we're pretty good at thinking now. Yeah. When you start thinking out... 30, 40, 50, 100 years, then we get into trouble. We just can't really conceive of the abstract mm-hmm. of decades from now. Yeah, uh, I think we'll start seeing movement on climate change in, in ways we haven't before, in part because people are now associating it with present events. So, mm-hmm. you know, well, I that's pretty obvious, isn't it? Like you see it on the news every day. Exactly. And, and now companies are starting to get on board. You're seeing with oil and gas companies, insurance companies are, are the canaries in the coal mines because they're looking and saying, right, we can't underwrite policies on floodplains anymore. Or we're not going to let you move back into your house in Gatineau if it's going to get flooded. You used to get flooded like this once every 100 years, and now it's 10 times or 30 times every 100 years. So forget it. You're going to start seeing that, and people will connect it. And you know, I lived in B.C. until recently, and, and during the last wildfire season in 18, people were saying this is climate change in ways that they had never said before. They were connecting the fires to climate change. I had never seen that in B.C. like that before. And so we're making the connections. But again, that's an example of how we're good at connecting things in the moment mm-hmm. and bad at, at trying to link them abstractly over time. Right. And looking at the recent election in PEI, <laughs> yeah. the Green Party had best, the best results they've ever had. I mean. In the entire country. I mean, they're the, they're the official opposition now. They were close to forming government. Uh, they went from one seat to, I think, nine seats. Mm. Uh, in BC in 2017, they tripled from one seat to three seats and doubled their popular support from eight to 16. Mm. Uh, they're, you know, they're benefiting, I think, from a few things. One is is that they're an environmental party and people care about that more than ever. Canadians are caring more and more about the environment. It'll be an election issue this year, for instance. But also, they don't have the baggage of the traditional parties. That's the thing, right? They're an honest they don't broker. have a track record. They're an yes, honest broker. So you can't... Uh... And that was BC in 2017. People looked around and said, I'm sick of the liberals. I don't, I don't trust the NDP. I'll give the Greens a try. I was joking. I wrote about PEI from McLean's. And I was saying, the Greens should you know, draw on Van Morrison and James Brown and make their slogan, if, if you're tired of what you got, try me. Because... Uh, that is that's part of what appeals to people about them. Mm-hmm. They're different, and they don't have that baggage. And, and so I think you'll see them do well federally in, in the fall as well. So, But again, I mean, it is, you know, there's a recent poll from Abacus Data, and they, they dug into climate 
and found that it's on the register for people in a way that it hasn't been before. It's a top issue for 12% of Canadians. It's top five for something like 40% of Canadians, yeah. which is a lot. And it's only going to go up. Usually what generates victories is the desire for change. That's pretty well all there is, it seems to me. We vote to... out. You know, it's funny. They have this old line that governments defeat themselves, so that Canadians vote governments out rather than voting them in. And 2015 was an interesting election for that because if you look at the polls, the Conservatives stay more or less flat throughout. The NDP goes from top to bottom, and the Liberals go from bottom to top. What that tells me, so it looks like an X with a blue line through the middle, and what that tells me is uh, this was a referendum on who the, the public wanted to replace the Conservatives with because they were tired of that politics. Now, now, and then let's just sort of wind down with this. People see what Trudeau did during Lavscan. Mm-hmm. They don't like it. They want to change, but they look at the alternative. And, in fact, the Liberals themselves are using this as... Uh, as a threat almost to, 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 you know, to vote for them because look at the alternative. Mm-hmm. This is so, the yeah. So, again, what is a smart political decision in the, weighing all this kind of scenario coming up in, in, uh, in October? You know, the liberals do this all the time. They exploit strategic voting to win. I mean, sort of the conservatives. And the NDP says you shouldn't strategically vote, except for in provinces where it benefits some of them because they do say you should strategically vote. I mean, in fact, they're saying it right now about the Greens. So the NDP actually is, they're fairly hypocritical when it comes to their messaging on strategic voting, but almost everyone is. That's party politics. You know, making a good political decision based on strategy isn't necessarily, or sorry, making a political decision based on strategy isn't necessarily a bad one. You might ask, say, I've collected the information, I have reasons, and I have good reasons to vote strategically because I like party A, I don't like party B, I prefer party C, but they're not going to win, so A it is. So that's fine, identifying that. It's perfectly reasonable to say that that's going to be the reason you vote because we have preferences that we in our head kind of rank, right? We, it's not like we like, dislike, it's black and white. It's like, mm-hmm. well, you know, depending on context. But if there's ways to minimize that, if, if what we want is to our true preferences to be the things that we vote on, not strategy, we can push for electoral reform. I mean, proportional representation, which I've supported publicly for a long time, mm. allows you to say, no, no, I'm going to vote my, my conscience because there's actually a fairly good chance that this member is going to be elected and then the politicians can figure it out for themselves in the legislature how they're going to govern together. And so I, I, do, I do think federally we should leave that on the table as an option. But I, I would say this to someone who wants to make a good political decision with how they vote in the fall. Um, you know, it's it's fine to say the criteria that I think are, is important for voting is strategic. It's fine also to say, I think it's substantive. I'm going to vote the party I like the best. That's up for the, in, the individual voter to, to decide for themselves. Well, what, about your, what about your ideals? Like, for example, uh, Jody Wilson-Raybould, mm-hmm. on the face of it, It appears that she stood up for her principles and that that, uh, you can trust her. Mm -hmm. And this is exactly the kind of person you want in politics. I guess, is it naive to, uh, assuming she goes to the Green Party, is it naive to to say that's what I want in Canada and I'm going to vote for the Green Party because of that? Not at all. In fact, I, I think that is, I would say that's a good political decision. If you say, look... I have decent data that suggests that this is a principled politician that I like and trust because she made a difficult decision that actually ended up harming her because she thought it was right. And that's what I want to reward in civic life because I think it's good for institutions and outcomes. If, if someone were to say that to me and say, therefore, I'm going to vote for Jody Wilson, whether she's a Green or an Independent or whatever, I would say actually that is but Ms. a great but Ms. We can't Across the country, you can't vote for her. If she runs as an independent, because the only people who can vote for her is in her riding. Yes, and well, this is that's one of the uh, of the problems, uh, you know, and that's true of most systems that are electing members to a legislature. Right? You you've got you dance with the people in your dance card, and that's going to be limited by where you are. But you know, you you can say I'm going to take that criteria. So here's what I would say to someone who says I want to vote for her. I can't. What am I going to do? I'd say take those criteria, that criteria, 
trustworthiness, principles, whatever, and, and apply it to your local writing and see if anyone fits. You might find that someone does fit, doesn't fit. You know, what you're coming up with is a, is a series of criteria that you can apply, which is great. I mean, that's a great matrix. People vote on, on, on all kinds of things. My, my argument for good political decisions is you should know the criteria that you're voting on. You shouldn't just assume that you know because you often don't, right? Mm-hmm. And So that's part of your sitting down and sort of thinking about. Yeah. So writing down a list of, of the criteria that you're looking for. Yes. And mm-hmm. I mean, I, I, you know, give myself an example. I have voted strategically in some elections. I voted on principle in others. And it has, has changed depending on the context of the election. But mm-hmm. it's something I think about a lot ahead of time. And, and in this election, for instance... Yeah, what are you going it, to vote? It's going to be... I haven't decided yet, but it's going to be a principled vote, I think. Me too. I, I'm in a riding where it probably isn't going to matter, which certainly makes it easier to vote your conscience when you know it. <laughs> but, right. uh, but, I mean, I have voted strategically in the past. I voted for several parties, um, both provincially yeah, and federally, uh, and... Yeah. and um, I am not a partisan in that sense. So, I mean, I I will probably vote out of principle in this case, though, uh, although I haven't quite made up my mind yet. And, and uh, one, one of my, uh, well, the philosophy of voting is to throw them out at every opportunity. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, I think a lot of Canadians agree with you. So what, so I'll tell you what I would like to see in the fall of 2019 is, is a minority government. Yeah. There was so much done during the mid '60s oh, with a minority government. Can you imagine getting the CPP the flag in, in Medicare yeah. in four years? Yeah, it's you know these days forget. And it's it, funny, isn't it, that Harper ran against a minority government? You know, don't allow this to happen. I, which is you know, it, and it also betrays a lack of understanding of the system. But uh, British Columbia right now is one of the best governed provinces in the country. It has a minority government, NDP, um, propped up by the Greens. I think it would be nice to see a minority government federally, perhaps the Liberals propped up by the NDP or the Greens or some combination of the two. Uh, it, it keeps parliamentarians honest, keeps mm-hmm. them on their toes. You've, I've, I've talked to people in government who've lived through minorities and they have very mixed feelings. It wears them down pretty fast, but it also keeps them honest. And I think that's good for, for democracy. It's just finally, I can't leave without bringing up the bobble-headed uh, MP backbenchers. It's just, you know, when you vote in an MP and you want them to represent you, and all they do is basically what the leader tells them to do, mm-hmm. that's disillusioning. That's, it's pathetic. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's funny, that this critique has been around for a long time. Pierre Trudeau once called them, you know, your nobody's yeah. hundred yards off of Parliament Hill. And, and they are. Train seals. And, and yeah. I have found, in my experience with backbenchers, you know, including opposition, um, people who aren't critics, shadow critics. Some are better than others, so you get a, there's a lot. But the, but the thing but is, in general, they all have to, they all fall into line. Like, look what happened with uh, <clears throat> yes Wilson Raybould. Now that was that that's party line, you yeah. know. But there are two principled women who got booted out of the party, and no one. Peeped well, a few. So there were. Here's a, what's interesting is is there are exceptions that prove the rule. So Nathaniel Erskine Smith is an interesting backbench liberal MP who routinely presses back against the government. He did on this. He did on electoral reform. He did on drug policy. So there are but one out of. But this is it. it, was, it he's the exception that proves the rule. Um, there is a fix for that. We could empower um, MPs by changing the way that the parliamentary system and, and, and parties work. There's a couple of ways to do that. One of them is to sort of adopt bits of Michael Chung's Reform Act, which parties don't really do because they don't want to give up power. The liberals yeah. didn't even vote on it. Yeah. Strictly speaking, they probably broke the law. And, uh, but there's no punishment outside of electoral punishment. And the other is uh, we, if we had more MPs, there was a study of this years ago by a, a political scientist named uh, Ned Franks, who just recently passed away, and uh, he found that in the UK, you don't really have party discipline. And part of the reason is there are so many MPs that the leadership can't corral them because they don't have enough carrot and sticks. Carrots and sticks. Yeah, they can't all be in cabinet. Yeah, or a, you know, a nice committee yeah. uh, chair or, what, or deputy chair or whatever it might be. So having more MPs would be a start. Uh, I'm all for that. Adopting sort of looser rules or giving caucus a little bit more say in who the leader is would do that as well. Right now, the way that we elect party leaders doesn't give caucus as much power to push back. 
you want to give a little more freedom to MPs to, to disagree. But I will say this. At the top level public in Parliament, they don't really misbehave. At the sort of caucus level and cabinet level, behind closed doors, they do. So there is some, they, they do push back, but mm. the problem is they push back privately, and we don't know what that effect is, and that's part of the problem. So, you know, I'd like to balance that a little bit by giving them a little more autonomy. But not Australia-style autonomy, because we don't want to go through a dozen prime ministers a year. <laughs> right. Just finally, uh, where, where do you, what do you want this book to do? Well, I, you know, ideally I'd like it to do two things. And, and the first is get people thinking about how they can be more rigorous and involved citizens, you know, and make better political decisions individually. Otherwise we're going to lose it. Otherwise we risk the whole thing falling apart. Uh, and, but the other thing is, is I would like to see governments take seriously the idea of participatory democratic practices that they can implement. I mean, governments, if they had the political will, could do any of this tomorrow, municipally, provincially, federally, even internationally. Uh, it, they could do it tomorrow. And so I'm, I'm going to be pressing, and I hope parties will listen, for a little bit more participatory democracy and, and policy responsiveness. So if I could get a little bit of action on, on that, it, it would go a long way. Good luck. Thank you very much. I've been speaking to David Mosscrop who is the author of Too Dumb for Democracy, Why We Make Bad Political Decisions and How We Can Make Better Ones, published by Goose Lane Editions. Thanks again. Thank you.